Yeah, heads um, will roll. Heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, 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 um, I just thought it was. I, I love the interview first of all, and I think what I loved about the interview the most was I got a chance to to listen to Oprah <laughs> and watch <laughs> you missed her. her huh? I, yeah, I miss Oprah. So I was I have so to excited say, about that. I have to say that I think Oprah gave us her best acting since The Color Purple. Oh, to pretend gave, to be shocked as she, well and as often as she did. It she was gave amazing. Me everything what? I wanted. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> Who, who's asking that? that? Right. I'm like, Oprah, <laughs> come on now. This is not surprising. <laughs> and I've seen, I've seen the memes, mm-hmm. and the memes have been just, just all her expressions. I think I've seen more memes of Oprah than I've seen of any other part of the interview, or Harry, or, or um, yeah. Meghan Markle. So she yeah. gave us. She gave us all that we needed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Welcome to episode four of Breaking It Down with DJ and Courtney. We'd like to start each episode with a little segment called What's Still Cooking. It gives Courtney and I a chance to highlight things that we have watched, read, or experienced over the last week that still may be lingering on our minds. So what's still cooking for me? I saw a movie trailer uh, recently about a bio, a bio series uh, about Rita Franklin, Ooh. and it stars Tony Winner and Academy Award nominee Cynthia Revo. And it's an eight part series uh, titled, I think I didn't say title already, but Genius Aretha that will debut Sunday, March 21st at 9 p.m. Eastern on National Geographic which is kind of strange, National Geographic. But the episodes will also be available to stream on Hulu starting Thursday, March 25th. And one of the executive producers is Clive Davis. Interesting. Yeah. I love Cynthia Erivo. I love her too. She's uh, she's very talented. She played in that movie, um, Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm, Harriet. um, Sorry. And she got nominated for that Academy Mm -hmm. Award there. I don't know if I can see her as Aretha, though, so that'll be interesting. Yeah, and her voice is not Aretha at all. I go on the trailer, her voice is very not Aretha, you know. But mm-hmm. Clive Davis is the one who's, and others are are backing this. I'm just shocked that he's not involved in the one that will be coming out later this year named Respect. But Aretha Franklin's family doesn't seem to be too happy, too happy about the bio series. Because her youngest son, Keycalf Franklin, published an Instagram post um, saying that he and his family are not happy about it. It quotes, here we go again. The family, the Franklin family is not in support of the Aretha Franklin National Geographic Genius Series. This deal was pushed through without our consent. Mm. If you are a true fan, please do not support it. We truly thank you for your support. So they're oh, not wow. in the bed or in the pot <laughs> with uh with Clive Davis. So they're not happy with Clive, okay? Yeah, and you know, in in the movie that's coming out with Jennifer Hudson, mm-hmm. um, called Respect, um, and that's more I think formidable. So it's like the family doesn't seem to be siding with Clive Davis, um, on on this. Um, well, I think that makes sense because I think Aretha was very picky about who would play her when she was alive. I think she did okay, J. J. Hud. She, she, I think, as far as I remember, I think J. Hud was o- approved. Yeah, she did approve <laughs> a re, um, for J. Hud to to play her. So, you know, you think Clive David is just trying to get, make some money off of this with his genius? No comment. Aretha? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> well, you know, Keycalf in his Instagram, he also said that he doesn't have any disrespect towards the actors. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Um, well, what's still cooking for me is Bruno Mars and Anderson Pax. They they joined forces to create Silk Sonic, and they left us with that banger. Leave the door open. It's still in my head. I'm always seeing it in between <laughs> anything. Um, and they apparently have recorded a full album, and they will also be performing at the Grammys. So mm. people listening, it would have happened yesterday. Um, mm-hmm. if you listen to it, the episode on Monday. But um, they weren't originally supposed to be one of the performers in the Grammys, but they used social media to petition Grammy organizers, and okay. it worked. Okay. And the song Leave the Door Open. 
Yeah, that's the uh, one I think. I, I hope that that's what they'd be performing. But you know, I like it. I like it. Yeah. it's an R and B vibe to it. It is. It's it's amazing how they're like they. I think they will. They're gonna save R and B. They're gonna get it off of uh, mm-hmm. life support. And yeah. R and B is back. <laughs> Hashtag Let Silk Sonic Thrive. Yeah, I like the it. The other thing that's cooking for me is the Kenneth Walker case is closed. So the boyfriend of Brianna Taylor. Um, can now sleep easier now that a Kentucky judge signed an order to permanently close the criminal case against him. He had been charged with attempted murder of a police officer when he fired a shot in self-defense after the police burst through their apartment door and murdered Breonna Taylor. Mm. The officer that was shot recovered from the leg wound and still remains on the Louisville Police Department. Yeah, that's so freaking sad. And I did see a little um, a little skit that was made they did a sort of a visual representation of what had happened that night. Mm-hmm. And maybe we'll leave it in the comments. Um, but it was yeah. just, it was really interesting. I thought, wow, how they just, it was just, it was badly done. Like the training was just, they said, even in the video, that the training they did was not done, they didn't do it correctly. Mm. Yeah, well, I'm really glad that justice was served for him. I think it was criminal that they would even charge him based on how they behaved. And we already know what happened to the other officers that were involved in that. Okay, so let's get into our first topic. And as everyone has already been talking about two Sundays ago, we got the return of the Oprah Winfrey show as Oprah (laughs) interviewed Meghan um, Markle and Prince Harry. And... You know, I I mean, I wasn't surprised, but in the interview, it was revealed that after being bullied in the press, having security denied for her son and expressing her own struggle with depression and suicide ideation, that the monarchy and that the monarchy was concerned about baby Archie's skin tone. Mm. um, They were, in essence, pushed out of being royals. Um, After that, we've seen quite a bit of aftermath. You know, the queen has responded. Um... Harry's brother has responded. There's been quite a bit of aftermath. Yeah, heads um, will roll. Heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 um, I just thought it was. I, I love the interview first of all, and I think what I loved about the interview the most was I got a chance to to listen to Oprah. <laughs> and watch you missed her, her huh? <laughs> I, yeah, I miss Oprah. So I was I have so to excited say, about that. I have to say that I think Oprah gave us her best acting since the color purple oh, to pretend gave, to be shocked as she, well and as often as she did it she was gave amazing me everything what? i wanted <laughs> what, what? <laughs> Who, who's asking that that right i'm like Oprah, <laughs> come on now this is not surprising <laughs> and i've seen, I've seen the memes mm-hmm. and the memes have been just just all her expression i think i've seen more memes of oprah than i've seen of in the other part of the interview, or Harry, or or um, yeah. Meghan Markle, so she yeah. gave us she gave us all that we needed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. It's also amazing to me, like some of the responses have been a lot of journalists that are applauding Oprah and her skill, mm-hmm. and I recognize that she did an amazing job. Oh, I, she did. I can't deny that. But I think a lot of these journalists had never seen that because they didn't grow up watching the Oprah Winfrey show. Right. And that just, you know, sort of aged me and 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 shocked me. <laughs> like, what? You haven't yeah. seen this genius before? <laughs> yeah, because she's not even, um, her show did, well, didn't air in certain countries like Switzerland. They never aired her show. Oh, so really? She got that situation where they didn't want to give her that handbag <laughs> because it was $30,000 mm. that Tom Ford... Because they didn't know who she was, because they they never seen the show. Mm. It doesn't air there. But there's still like a lot of American journalists because they're so young; they just didn't grow up with her watching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So she's actually getting a new a new audience. Yeah, she is. This. She is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I hope that means that they'll put more of her shows, like archives of the show, on own to watch. Yeah, I've been I, I it, secretly I've been downloading all the stuff that she's been putting on own. <laughs> <laughs> on 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 YouTube because I'm like I don't want them to, like I feel they want to take it down so I'm like let mm. me get it before so I have this big archive of of Oprah mm, mm, mm. um we'll we'll, we'll you no know, we'll we'll erase that <laughs> <laughs> not not 
But one of the things that I thought was interesting was um, this, the fallout of it all. Mm -hmm. So how did you feel about all the fallout that's going well, on? Well, I think it's really interesting because I think there's one conversation that's being had in terms of like racism in the monarchy mm -hmm. um, and it being surprising. And then there's another conversation that I think needs to be had that isn't, I'm not hearing um, talked about, which is the monarchy's relationship to colonialism and slavery mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. to me it's a direct correlation to racism of course there's racism in the monarchy yeah. um so that's what i thought was interesting i was really disappointed with the queen's response you know she says um what did she say she said something like while recollections may differ it's deeply troubling and we're going to handle it within the family and that while recollections may differ sounded very shady and i felt like she was calling megan a liar um yeah that's, that's just the my read <laughs> thing that i was like you know how she's been attacked in the public after the story after the interview is like mm -hmm. okay is she's a victim is she a is she fair game is she a liar and i believe she's fair game for me when you say fair game what do you mean well i mean by fair game is she when she stepped into that role and regardless if you are oblivious to how this operation, like you were saying, you we, we know that there's there's racism in um, because you know this is a, 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 a if you think about white bread family, it gets no whiter than the, the than the the royals, okay? <laughs> the queen, right. the queen, right? <laughs> you know, and you you know you get I, think about my black self getting into that family, it, it would be it would be a problem, a big problem. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that, that there's no way that she could have been so naive that she didn't know that she was going to, her presence in that family wasn't going to rock some boats and well, cause some disruption. Well, there is a way that she could be that naive. And mm -hmm. that could be, you know, she was benefiting from her um, privilege of colorism. There you you go. know, like she mm -hmm. was palatable as a black woman and she had wealth. Um, you know, so perhaps she didn't go through the world thinking about her blackness in a certain way so that it would be top of mind as she's entering into this family. I don't know. And, 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 and I, I don't know that. And I also just want to say, because I know that my tone doesn't sound very compassionate to her, to her. Um, I do feel very compassionate to her and her experience. Um, I don't think it's unique. So the, to, to be surprised by it is what I, I don't understand, mm -hmm. but to, to be in that situation and then not have the protection of the firm was wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And for her to feel yeah, explain, suicidal explain. ideation, my heart goes out to her. And I feel I have no compassion for the firm for not providing her support um, to either cut off the, 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 the things that the tabloids were doing or to provide her the mental health support that she needed. I have no, I have no compassion for them failing her in that way. Explain to me what the firm and the institution and the yeah. family what all that is sure because... sure sure so i'll i'll um i'll explain a little bit so the word the institution really means the entire palace anyone who works in the palace um you know like the person who winds up the queen's clock which apparently is an actual role <laughs> is part of the institution i need so that it's... job <laughs> it's the family business so i saw some article that sort of aligned the royals with the kardashians in in mm -hmm. a way they're mm -hmm. not the same but like the the queen use, is the head of do. state but it don't they don't have any like legal power right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they 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 do have some power because they influence tourism um you know so their business as a family is about public image it's all about public image right mm -hmm. they go visit the commonwealth they do all those tours and things like that so that's the family business and that's called the institution so anyone who works in the palace is a part of the institution then there is the firm which is like the pr branch of the institution so they are the ones that manage the reputation so in the interview i think harry and maybe both of them they alluded to the relationship that the, the royals have with the press it's almost like a quid pro quo type of situation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the firm is. And then apparently uh, last December, the firm included a smaller circle and it's called the firm of eight, which includes the queen, Prince Edward and his wife, Sophie, Kate Middleton and Prince William, Prince Charles and Camilla and Princess Anne. And mm. so as you see, 
Prince Harry is not involved in that. The firm, all right. The firm, right. The firm of eight. Um, And so it just brings to question, especially I've seen this analysis recently, that the Queen released her response to the interview, but then Prince Andrew spoke out aside to that publicly when she said, we're going to hand it privately. And he goes, the royals aren't racist. Yeah. yeah. So it seems like there's some, there's some disconnect or falling apart within the firm right now after that interview. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that someone, someone actually asked him, he was out. I saw the the interview where it was, it was an interview. It was him walking with this black woman. I said, Oh, they do a little PR thing. Cause he was walking with this black (laughs) woman. And, um, and someone asked, you know, a question and they don't show you the question that was asked. They always show his response to the question. And Mm -hmm. it was, you know, we're very much not a a racist family, but you do, but the truth is they do live in a bubble. Oh, of course. And, um, and living in a bubble will, will cause you to be racist. I'm sorry. Just, you know, there's no way that you can understand black people if you're not dealing with black people in a positive, productive way. Right. I think there's a really great Time article that sort of explained what I was hinting at earlier about the conversation Mm -hmm. that hasn't been uh, discussed. And the title of the article is How Meghan and Harry's Interview Blew Open the Monarchy's Troubled History with Race. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's like, you know, recognizing that you, you cannot separate the monarchy from its past and you cannot separate, um, how it got its wealth. You know, there's no reason, like the reason they're able to be the family business they are is because of the relationships um, and the power dynamics within those relationships with mm-hmm. all these countries um, that mm-hmm. are now impoverished. Yeah, colonialization, you know, we can have a whole talk about right. colonizing uh, India and all these different countries, mm-hmm. Africa, mm-hmm. and how, when they left those countries were they better off and right. the question is no no absolutely not i was happy to hear that barbados is um this year i think going to remove the queen from the head of state and she'll no longer be on the currency i was actually really disappointed <laughs> uh Why? Why? um no not, not not about that i was disappointed when i went to dominica for the first time okay years ago because i had studied abroad in ghana and one of the things that I really, really enjoyed was seeing black people on the currency. So when I mm-hmm. went to Dominica, I was disappointed to see the queen on the currency. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm happy to hear that Dominica, I mean, Barbados is going to be changing that soon. Yeah, well, um, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how they're going to sort of PR this, you know, how they're going to flip this, um, how they're going to, what's the word, swing it. Flip it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really interesting and it's a really interesting time in humanity, you know, with Brexit going on, um, with all of the social activity that's been happening in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the social consciousness is raising where people are now having to discuss race and the mm-hmm. impacts of it. Um, and the years in the years and years and years that it hasn't been discussed, all of that needs to be rectified. Mm-hmm. So I think we're we're on the brink of seeing a lot of change. I don't know what's going to happen with the monarchy, um, but the interview definitely damaged their image, and that's mm-hmm. going to damage their business because that that's their image is business. You know. Do you think they regret Harry, Mary, and Meghan after that interview? I think they regretted it when it happened. When would it happen? <laughs> when they married. I mean, when, it's clear. They when they got it? married, they regretted it because they didn't protect her. <laughs> They, their I job, think they regretted they, it when soon that he showed up with her. <laughs> yeah, 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 I agree. I agree. And, you know, I'm actually really, really, really curious to know what Megan's mom thinks mm-hmm. about all, all of this and yeah. what her experience has been. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, but she's like, been a good mother. She's the reason why, I mean, she spoke so well of her mother, and mm-hmm. I was blown away by how disparaging. She didn't, she didn't really talk to disparaging of her father, but she was just saying, you know, he didn't protect me. But my mother, she stayed out of the tabloid. She stayed away from from giving the the um, the media this, you know, three stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's really interesting what their life, Harry and Meghan, is going to be like now that this has happened. Because mm-hmm. it seems that Harry's estranged from his family. 
Mm -hmm. Megan's estranged from her father. Yeah. So, you know, they have Megan's mother. And they both are. They're both estranged from their fathers now. Right, right, right. So, exactly. So, like, he's... I I said Harry's estranged from his family. So, that includes his father. (laughs) Um, And Megan's estranged from her father. I'm just saying they had those similarities, you know. Those similarities, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I'll get into that later, but about when people get married, they have these similarities that sort of drive them together you know yeah well so they have each other megan's mom and tyler perry <laughs> <laughs> i love it <laughs> all right so let's wrap it up what's your breakdown on all of this well my breakdown is you know there's a there's a deeper conversation about racism that we need to have and what this ha- what this has done what this with this whole interview has done has broke down the door so that we can have this conversation at the highest level of 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 whiteness mm-hmm. <laughs> that we never we haven't had before because no one has ever publicly said you know it's been said you know comedians and all that but no one has said it in the mainstream media about this racism that occurs inside of the highest levels of society right yeah and i'm glad I- this happened Say that again. I'm I'm glad that that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that's happening. My breakdown is I think it's time to look at the legacy uh, of racism all over the world. Um, Look at the the roots of colonization and how that impacts societies now. And while it's really clear that Megan, I think, is owed um, compassion at the least from her, her experience being in the royal family thus far. But all of these other countries are also owed things, maybe reparations. Um, so mm. I think that this is the start of getting to that 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 movement. Do you think if we were to get reparations, um, Meghan Markle only get fifty percent? Because <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm not answering that. We're wrapping it up. <laughs> So this is the segment where we have we call make you laugh and we find a topic or, or I, something that we saw that was that was funny and I think, every, I think the entire world in my mind has saw coming to America the sequel and it was released on Friday March 5th on Amazon mm-hmm. Prime Video um, I, of course I immediately after I was done with work I went got my popcorn and I got in my bed and I turned on my tel- my my flat screen TV mm-hmm. and um, began watching coming to America and the first 30 minutes of it I was totally sold I was just a smile on my face and then slowly slowly the next 30 minutes I cut the TV off and went to sleep <laughs> oh, wow yeah and then I knew I was talking about it um, mm-hmm. so I had to force myself to watch oh, the wow. last bit of it um, I would say overall I'm disappointed um oh. in it and the reason why i'm, I'm very clear i mean it's, it's one of those happy-go-lucky movies i'm quite sure we'll be watching it on some saturday afternoon on cable no <laughs> no i don't think i need to see it again but i won't say i'm disappointed i'd watch the original on a saturday afternoon oh but... def- I, I watched the original <laughs> i mean I, I watched it actually a couple of weeks ago you know mm-hmm. so um I'm, I'm still i still love the, the original yeah. But what I think what caused this movie to fail is because it has no 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 real antagonist. Um and they put a focus on But wait, did the original? Yeah, um Daryl Jinx oh, was okay. the antagonist. Okay. And But what about what about Wesley Snipes' character in the sequel? He wasn't the antagonist? He, he was funny, um <laughs> cutesy. <laughs> and he nobody it was no threat from General Easy. <laughs> <laughs> you know well i mean so, that was the whole impetus for um him to go back to america to find his son because he was going to be killed by the general if he didn't have you know when, an heir when, when they were exercising heir. they were on they were doing spin cycle they were doing spin <laughs> they were doing aerobics it, it just wasn't no threat there you didn't okay. you didn't feel there was any threat of general easy taking over uh Zumba, Samunda, you know, Mm -hmm. so that was not an antagonist. If they thought it was, it wasn't. And then sort of kind of they went to a little bit about the daughter who really was the the real heir 
because mm-hmm. she's the first born. Well, right. she, she's well, not really the first born, but she's uh, I guess the first what you would born call. of the royal family. Yeah, legitimately. Right. And not um, the bastard child. Not the bastard. And they kept saying it over <laughs> again: the bastard <laughs> child. The, and I'm just like, wow, you know, really. And you know, I think that's a nod to like African culture, though. You know, being a bastard child is a real. That's a big deal. Like that's a yeah. big no no. So. I, I think, think it was a nod to fathers being in the home and too. I think it was some sort of kind of like the little nod to that. Um, but they should have focused to me. They should have focused more so on the daughter because she was just amazing to me. The girl yeah. who played Kiki Lane. Well, she her, her name is Kiki Lane, mm-hmm. and she did an awesome job as the oldest daughter. And um, you know, it just wasn't. The focus on was on the wrong thing. The son wasn't charismatic. The guy who played the son wasn't charismatic at all. Wow. It, yeah. He, he, I think you're kind of harsh, DJ. I think um, you're being uh, kind of hard on I it. I mean, people, and when you touch something like this, and you and he says that you know they worked four years on the on the script. No, you had thirty years <laughs> <laughs> to work on this script. Okay. There's no reason why. This should be this bad. Well, it was characters that we didn't see, like Allison Dean, who played the sister of Lisa, mm-hmm. um, Patrice Medowell, Eric LaSalle, uh, Derek Jinks, mm-hmm. um, Mage Sinclair, who played Queen Joffre, who passed away. Right. Well, she was sort of in the film. We saw her yeah, feature, we saw, her, we her saw picture, picture, and we they, they talked about her. And we even saw a picture of Allison Dean, who played Patrice McDowell. Um, I, I was hoping I would see Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> As the arm what would he be? Like, what would he be in the sequel? You know, he, he's he's reformed. You know, okay, okay. <laughs> and Frank Fajan, who played the slum landlord, he's mm-hmm. not in it as well. So, you know, but most of the characters from the original are back in this with new characters as well. I'm sure they, you were happy to see Randy Watson. Yeah, you know, chocolate. singing. Uh, we are family. I think it was we are family mm-hmm, or something. Yeah. He was singing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was over the top, and I, I and I get it. They went big instead of dealing with content. You know, I was happy to see one of my favorites make a cameo as himself, almost Trevor Noah. Okay, yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. He, I, I like that. <laughs> that was um, cute. So that that was cute because he's actually from Africa. Yeah, he's so, from, he's, he's South so, African. So yeah. that made sense. Mm-hmm. So. I just wish it would have. They would have focused more on things that made sense instead of going after sort of the big frog when it really didn't need to to be. And then what a king, what a king, what a king! In Vogue shows up with salt and pepper, and you're like, and then uh, then we have um, uh, Gladys Knight who sang in Midnight mm-hmm. Train to Zamunda. <laughs> I'm just like, well, I'm sorry. Oh. The funeral, that was hilarious. We should have the funeral while I'm still alive. That was yeah. funny. Now, I like that, you know, but <laughs> just the corniness of the songs, I didn't like. But I felt was heartfelt when he passed away. He wanted to see his own funeral. Yeah, I like that, but it just could have been done classier than than how they did it. I didn't, I didn't believe King Joffre was going to, you know, like, what a king, what a king. I mean, come on. You know, I think he had died by that point. So, <laughs> yeah, so he didn't even see that part. <laughs> well, know. I agree. I don't think it's a classic. It's not something I'm rushing to see again. I probably won't watch it over and over again. But I mm-hmm. thought it was the laugh that we needed now. So it was. Yeah. Good yeah. It was it was it was family fun. Mm-hmm. I put it. I, I'll leave it at that. So for our next segment, we want to focus in on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which was uh, passed through the Senate, um, I believe, uh, March 9th. You mean through the uh, House? Through right? the House. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Through the House. It hasn't got reached the Senate just yet. And uh, the trial of Derek Chauvin, the former police officer charged with killing Floyd, is scheduled to begin in Minneapolis on Tuesday, March 9th. So that's the March 9th date. Okay. Um, so Derek, Derek Chauvin, who was filmed um, kneeling, you know, famous uh, footage of him kneeling Infamous. on um, George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds, literally choking the, light up, uh, choking the life out of him, was charged with second-degree murder and manslaughter charges. Recently, they upgraded that to include a third-degree manslaughter charge as well, which mm-hmm. is kind of odd that you would have a second-degree and a third-degree. So... Um, I'm interested in how that was going to turn out. Um, 
as of now, they're uh, actually um, determining the uh, individuals who will sit on the jury at mm -hmm. this present moment. But what I really wanted to focus in on was the, the actual George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And when I was researching this story, I ran into something called the um, Qualified Immunity um, and what that was. And mm -hmm. there's a history behind this Qualified Immunity, which was also called the Ku Klux Klan Act passed in Congress in 1871. Right. So... Um, one of the things that I really keyed in on was how this Qualified Immunity Act sort of was there to protect uh, citizens, um, particularly African Americans. And over the years, uh, this uh, act has sort of backfired and done the opposite. It has allowed police officers to get away with acting more maliciously and not holding them accountable for uh bad police um for bad policing right right what do you think about that yeah so i think this is an important discussion um and i think it's also in i think it's an important discussion one because it shows how this country works and how the systems work to perpetuate oppression mm -hmm. um and i also think it's important to get the nuance of how what you said is true how the qualified immunity um started well it didn't start out as qualified immunity so let me just do a quick history lesson um to explain how we got to where we are with qualified immunity so when the civil war ended and the confederate loss i'm pausing for emphasis the confederate loss <laughs> okay everyone doesn't everyone doesn't remember that or doesn't recognize that but the confederate loss and then reconstruction began and we got the reconstruction amendments to the constitution we got the 13th Amendment, which made slavery illegal in 1865. We got the 14th Amendment, which granted citizenships due process and equal protection of the law in 1866. And then the 15th Amendment, which ensured voting rights um, to, um, and making it illegal to deny people the right to vote based on their race in 1870. As you can imagine, the Confederate, there were lots of sore losers. They were not happy about this. So after the... Um, amendments were ratified, they still needed acts to enforce the amendments. So in 1870, there was a Civil Rights Act, which was um, the first KKK Act um, to enforce the 15th Amendment, which made it illegal for people to, to deny people the right to vote uh, mm -hmm. based on their race. So if people could vote, people were not happy with that. And um, you know, a lot of violence happened to prevent people to vote still. So in 1871, the Civil Rights Act of 1871 was passed, which is known as the second KKK Act. And this is the one that was supposed to protect people from being mistreated and having, it was supposed to enforce the 14th Amendment. So it's supposed to protect people from having their rights violated, especially by the police. Right. So it gave people who a lot of times were Ku Klux Klan members. Exactly, in the South. exactly. Are you a KKK? Are you the police? Are you the same? Mm -hmm. it, it was hard to tell. But it provided um, people the right to seek relief in a federal or district or circuit court if their rights were violated by the police. So that was in 1871. We had, we had the act. We thought that we were good. But in 1967, during the Civil Rights Movement, we were introduced to qualified immunity, which you said made the act backfire. So what happened is during the court case, Pearson v. Ray, I want everyone to look that up. It's a really interesting court case about the Mississippi Freedom Riders. During that court case, the lawyer cited the Civil Rights Act of 1871. But the Supreme Court at that time ruled that, you know, we don't want to have all of these uh, cases going against police officers and, and pre preventing them from doing their job. So we're going to say that if a law officer acts in good faith and they believe their conduct is authorized by law, they aren't accountable. So that's when the, the KKK Act, the second KKK Act of 1871 sort of became null and void because uh -huh. police officers, if they believed they were in good faith, then you couldn't bring a suit against them. And so then later in 1982, the court case Harlow v. Ferguson, I mean, for Harlow v. Fitzgerald expanded qualified immunity to the clearly established part. So it made it so that any public official could receive 
qualified immunity unless there was a clearly established case. So that means like the same circumstance was proven um, that rights were violated, but you already had that good faith, acting in good faith needed to be present. Um, and then now this clearly established and then it expanded to all public officials. People should look up that court case as well, Harlow v. Fitzgerald, because surprise, surprise, Nixon is involved in that. So mm -hmm. I think it's the reason why I wanted to explain the history behind it is because you can clearly see that race is a factor, right? right? These things didn't change until the civil rights movement because it was a way to suppress that movement. If you make it illegal or if you make it so that a court case can't be brought against a police officer unless um, or you, you grant immunity to a police officer, then you allow them to continue to stop these protests that are happening, stop the freedom, the rides, stop the sit-ins and have no recourse. And so now we're, you know, in the year 2020, 21, and these police officers have all of this free reign to do things and they know that they're not going to have a suit brought against them because they have this immunity. And so right. what you're saying is that the George Floyd bill is addressing some of that, right? Yeah, it, it is going to address, uh, it's, you know, reform that you can't, it's going to ban choke holds. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it will um, ban no knock warrants Great. in certain cases. Mandate data collection on police encounters, prohibit racial and religious profiling, and redirect funding to community based community based policing programs. Right. So um what was shocking to me was that this is not the first time that this bill has been proposed to the House then the Senate since Senate. Senate. Um, last year, the House passed a similar version of the bill, but it failed in the Republican controlled Senate. This time around, Senate, um, Senate Democrats will have to sway at least 10 Republican members to for the bill to pass to mm. get through the Senate. So this isn't the first time that has actually been seen by the House and, and approved by the House. It actually is the second time that it will be um, litigated and, um, and voted on by the Senate. So hopefully this time it will get through the Senate so that we actually can have these um, these amendments made. For those people who have senators, I want you to call your senators to make sure that this goes through. Um, you know, and it's like, <laughs> we need so much reform in this country in terms of how we get things done. All right. Because I, 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 it's appalling to me. It's not shocking. It's appalling and egregious that this is a partisan issue. Like, how can this be a partisan issue? Yeah, it's uh, it's shocking. It's really, really shocking because, you know, I, I, I'm going to do a whole different show on how society views black men. It's, 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 it's tragic. And it's not that, you know, I'm, as a black man, I am, I mean, I'm not in any gangs. I'm, I'm, I know I don't have a, a risk record or anything like that. But um, I'm viewed the same way as those individuals who, uh, who and that's a part of every single society there's that 10 percent that's going to be doing all kinds of crazy things in every society mm -hmm. and but because you're african-american male you're included in that 10 percent, even though you're not right you're included so because i think 15 percent of this country is african-american but and and the 10 percent of all bad people in this country you're included automatically by default a part of that 10 percent that's in every country because you are african-american and that's just wrong right it's wrong and you know and i think that's why like i haven't read the entire george floyd floyd bill i haven't had time yet but if it doesn't address qualified immunity then it's it's those little small things are are cute and and needed but Police need to be held accountable because we already know, like you just said, just by the color of your skin and being male, you're a target. You know, we already learned this when Brown v. Board of Education passed that implicit bias is real, right? If, mm -hmm. if, if children can decide that a doll is good and bad based on the shade of its color in 1940, if, if children know that, if Dr. Kenneth Clark and Dr. Mamie Clark were able to prove that, then why is it that we need to, to do all of this to say that police also have this implicit bias? And it may not even just be implicit. It can be explicit. Like, mm -hmm. they can know that you are not a gang member, but then just claim, oh, I was acting in good faith because he looked like a gang member. 
right? Right. Yeah. That 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 needs to be taken out. We can't have police officers having this free reign and no accountability. Taking it away, making it illegal to do chokeholds, great. Making it illegal to have no no knock warrants, great. But if there's still no opportunity for full accountability, because what 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 happens is the police officer can say, you know, um, oh, I thought I was doing my job, right? And mm-hmm. that's it. And then what happens is they so don't So what get they're doing is they're piecemealing. Yeah. Like they look at every mm-hmm. single incident and now we're going to focus on like, okay, okay, well, we haven't had that incident yet. So we're not going to, you know, debate that or, or adjudicate that. It's like, okay, we, we had the chokehold situation um, with the gentleman who, name slips my mind, who was, uh, I can't breathe. Mm-hmm. We had the Brianna situation. Mm-hmm. So now they, like, each situation, they are knocking that out. But do we have to have every single situation happen before we actually knock that out? The, Absolutely. Of, 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 like, how many people have to die? That's what, that's, that's what the problem that I have with it um, is that it doesn't really solve. I mean, people say, people were calling it the, <laughs> we're calling the George Floyd Justice Policing Act. But when you really start reading it, it really does nothing mm-hmm. until you... Um, handle the qualified immunity. Until you handle that, then you really haven't done anything to reduce um, bad policing. I think all of this is is uh, great that we're talking about it because mm-hmm. this is really showing how we always have to be involved in the political process with the understanding that any progress that's made for inclusivity and um, and equity is going to face backlash, right? Mm-hmm. So the reason that we have a Democrat in the White House right now is because of all of the work that Stacey Abrams and all the other organizers did to flip Georgia um, and Pennsylvania, right? But now we have all of this backlash to put barriers into the 15th Amendment. There are people right now in Congress who are in, in, in all of the states that are making it harder for people to vote, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's the big one now. Right. And so, but we need to have the, we need to be able to vote because our vote is going to impact who's in Congress, who is in the White House, which is also going to impact who's on the Supreme Court. Because if it wasn't for the Supreme Court, we wouldn't even have qualified immunity because the KKK Act, the second KKK Act made it so that we could um, seek accountability from the police. But because of that Supreme Court ruling in 1967, it's null and void. And so it's like, now we have to, so that was 1967. We're years beyond that. And we're still dealing with the repercussions, right? right. So right. if you have a senator, I would make sure that you're, you're doing what you can to make sure that they are at least getting the George Floyd bill done. Right. But also making sure that we can do something to address qualified immunity. I don't have a senator. I'm in D.C., <laughs> at least not yeah. yet. Um, so it's, it, it's just, I think this is just another call for us to, we have to. We can't fall asleep now. Just because yeah. we don't have that man in the in the office, and we, mm. we, we don't have anyone to be angry at, we stay still woke, need to folks. pay attention. Stay That's woke. right. Stay woke. Stay woke. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so some of the things that I that, that came up for me in my, my breakdown about mm-hmm. about how we utilize local and federal government funds, about uh, transparency, tracking, and training, because without the proper training and frequent remedial training for police officers, Mm -hmm. the money gets wasted. If there's no transparency in the due process, which is our Fifth Amendment, then the training, the money gets wasted. If there is no real uh, true background, comprehensive background investigation of the police that you're hiring, when I had to get my, you know, clearance with the federal government, they started asking neighbors and family members and everybody about, my history and who I was and what countries I've been to. And it, to me, that has to also be all, those funds allocated to doing complete investigations of, uh, and I was just, you know, doing administrative work, you know, not infecting anybody's real life, but it was more emphasis done on me than even a person who's going to carry a gun and police society. So I think that we need to really reevaluate how we utilize the p- funds that we are giving um, local and government um, officials in terms of policing. Yeah, that's great, DJ. The three T's. What are they again? Uh, training, transparency, and tracking. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree. I think um, my biggest breakdown and takeaway is the need for all of us to be involved in the entire process, you know, the judicial system, um, the voting part, like all of it, the executive branch, we all need to be involved in it. Um, and also we need to address and call out the racism that has been embedded in the fabric. Um, you know, just quickly, we, we just sh showed how race was the motivating factor to make something that was helpful into something that's harmful. Mm -hmm. Um, and it continues to happen. And until we actually address it, we can't change it. Right, right. So I, I agree. We need this strong will topic. officers. Yeah, and we can go. Yeah. It's, this is just a piece of it, the tapestry mm -hmm. of this conversation. So yeah, yeah. So if you follow us on social media, Instagram and Facebook, you already know what the Inspire segment is because we posted on Friday to make sure that you could participate. But I wanted to shout out one of my Twitch friends, Fran Boogie, for spearheading a three-day virtual fundraiser where 40 DJs came together to raise funds and bring awareness to an organization called Stop AAPI Hate. Um, it's a coalition that is addressing the anti-Asian hate during the pandemic. There's been a lot of that. Um, there hasn't been a lot of coverage, so it's really important work that Stop AAPI Hate is doing. They had a modest goal and they exceeded it. Wow, um, that's great. I didn't, I haven't checked yet, but they did, they, they did close the fundraiser on Friday. Um, but I'm sure people can still help out Stop AAPI Hate. You can check them out. Um, and what does AAPI stand for? Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> Asian American Pacific Islander. So because, you know, uh, during the pandemic, people have, there's been a lot of rhetoric around, you know, where the coronavirus came from. And mm -hmm. so there's just been a lot of, of hate and violence against Asian Pacific and um, Asian American Pacific Islander citizens um, across the country. Um, and so it's important for us to, one, support those communities, um, support like their businesses, but also to protect them because no one deserves that. And um, yeah. uh, again, I don't think it's been talked about a lot. Yeah, because what perfect, what affects one of us affects all of us. Absolutely, you know, absolutely. So, mm -hmm. Because, you know, I see, you know, we, we're getting attacked, but we're not the only ones that are being, um, as African-Americans that are, are dealing with um, racism. Mm hmm. Actually, a absolutely. Um, you know, just like I don't know if you if you got the chance to see Judas and the Black Messiah, but you know, it's, it's on my list. It's okay, on my list. But, like what was and I really finally got HBO Max. Oh, good. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> well, what was really um, important and threatening to um, the the FBI was that when oppressed people join together, we're stronger. You know, uh -huh. like when you when you look just globally at people of color across the globe, we're not a minority. We are no. the majority. So right. when we join together, we're stronger um, against all oppression. So I just wanted to shout out this cause, let people know that there are organizations that are working to support this effort. Um, and it's inspiring. And if you want to participate, you can when if you want to know more about the fundraiser that's ended, you can go to spreadlovestophate.com, but you can also look up Stop AAPI Hate uh, to find out ways that you can support. And they're also collecting incidences of violence. So if you have witnessed or you know someone who's experienced violence, um, check out their webpage so that you can report it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that's episode four, huh? Yeah, episode four. I am enjoying listening to the to our, our and of course i'm i'm a host so of course i'm <laughs> going to enjoy listening to you know us but i'm glad that people are are listening and we actually i don't know if we mentioned it already but we crossed our 100 100 plus uh threshold of list of plays yes so we are excited about that we're waiting for our thousand plus plays <laughs> right well thank you for listening people yeah thank you for listening and um i just want you to start to comment and send us <laughs> emails and um because i really want to know what topics and ideas that you may want to bring to the table have us break down and um and yeah what do you think about that yeah i agree you know this is just season one 
Um, and we have what eleven more episodes to go. So yeah. if you have feedback on what you would like to hear, if we should do anything differently, let us know. Uh, leave us a review. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, just go down and leave us a five star review and and some comments. That's gonna help us out. Um, but yeah, comment on social media, share our content. Um, we're on Instagram at Breaking It Down Show and Facebook at Breaking It Down Podcast. Yeah. Um, and DJ, what's our email address? Breaking It Down Show at Gmail dot com. That's right. So connect with us. We're here. We, you know, I get text messages from people that you guys are listening, and I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, engage with us on socials. Yeah, engage, and maybe they're. You know, we're, we're discussing it, but there may be some some uh, some some prizes for one <laughs> for a few people. It's still that, in discussion. It's still in discussion. So don't don't about, get your hopes up. <laughs> you know, so uh, so hopefully that, that may be coming. All right. All right. Well, we'll see you next week. Thanks see you next for listening. Week. Take care.